This is Philips Auction House in London. It's holding a sale of international contemporary art. And there's an awful lot of money in this room. In recent times, the art market has seen unprecedented levels of sales. Forget Porsches and yachts. The new status symbol of choice is something to hang on your wall that speaks of your discernment and taste. The spread of the free market means that there's huge untapped potential in countries like Russia, China and India. It means that art has truly gone global and prices have rocketed. For four million and two hundred thousand pounds. So, thank you so much. I feel a bit like a sports commentator at a football match. You know, this is half time and there's a lot of excitement here, and no one knows yet what the score is going to be. We just saw uh, a Damien Hurst go for over four million pounds. We just saw this uh, Andy Warhol, the one over there, go for 2.1 million pounds, a hammer and sickle. And now we're going to see the Russian work going, and they've got um, very, very big reserves on them. And I can't resist joining in. This picture by Boris Mikhailov has caught my eye. Its lower estimate matches the upper limit I've set myself, £5,000. To two, gentlemen in front, to four, Laura Garbino, to four, £3,500. But the room is full of Russians, bidding intently. Three, eight, new bidder on my left now, £3,800. Um, £4,000, four, two in front, four, two, several places now, four, five, four, eight, all over the place now, four, eight, £5,000. The bid is on my left, 5000 yes, five, five. I can feel the rubles in the air around me. £6,000 now, 6000 ladies' bid on my left. It's a striking picture, but the price has gone beyond my limit. I can't afford to get into a bidding war. Sold and it Welcome to the cutthroat world of buying contemporary art. No work of art provides a more telling response to the giddiness of these cash-soaked times than Damien Hirst for the love of God, the most expensive work ever created by a living artist. With typical brio, Hirst adorned a skull with over 8,000 diamonds and a 50 million pound price tag. And, as you'd expect, he's fully embraced its potential as an icon. It has its admirers and detractors. Well, I think it's a wonderful commentary on death, life, art, and the art market. I think Damien is definitely deliberately testing the limits of the art market. That skull is an, is an icon or a representative of that marriage between art and money. And perhaps in that sense, it's a, it's a great object. Um, I think it's obscene. I think it should go in a casino. But the question remains. Who is it laughing at? And what does it say about the times we live in? For most of the last half century, New York has been the undisputed capital of the contemporary art world. But that's changing. When British artist Damien Hirst's in town, everyone pays attention. He's become the flagship brand of the new wave of modern art and the hottest ticket in town. So it's no surprise to see him expand his product range at the art-friendly Prada store on Broadway. And if you like that jacket, you're out of luck. Apparently it's a one-off. But Damien's not the only Brit who's drawing a crowd. Across town, at the renowned Pace Wildenstein Gallery, people are queuing round the block to get into the new show from another hotshot British artist, Keith Tyson, whose epic new work occupies the entire gallery space on 25th Street. Tyson calls it Large Field Array, the result of two and a half years' work with an army of helpers, or a century of man-hours, as Tyson puts it. While the crowd builds, Tyson gives me a quick preview of the piece. It's a cross between mythology and a planetary alignment. African-American history, a photo of my family, a cube of tattooed flesh, and the molten 
basketball player relates to the space-time cubes, and the lollipop relates across to the girl who's up in the window. The cone itself is the Tower of Babel upside down. We've got the Secret Service of Saudi Arabia, which is used for bipolar disorder. We have a, a wedding cake there. The relationship to Jean-Paul Sartre fruit machine with the cigarettes, JPS, and to Jupiter that's in this box. Yes, you've got it. Life, the universe, and everything. It certainly doesn't lack ambition. It's all about how you define the space between these objects. Because when you put two objects together, there's a relationship, and I'm exploring those relationships. And Tyson hasn't ignored the thorny relationship between art and money either. Dominating one corner of the space is the live Nasdaq stock market feed. It's current market information being fed into the piece. So have you sold this yet? Yes, it's sold. Yeah, and, It's uh, one piece, the whole thing. You can't buy them separately. You just... So what are, we, what are we talking here? We're talking five figures, six figures... Seven figures. Seven figures. In a show of solidarity, Damien arrives. Rumours are flying as to who's bought the piece. I have my suspicions. So are you the uh, mysterious owner of this? Yeah. <laughs> but where are you going to put it? It's a big piece, so I can't put it in my living room. No. Yeah, so it'll need a space, so it's watch this space, really. It's October in London, and a series of huge tents in Regent's Park is about to play host to what's become one of the unmissable dates in the art calendar. Anyone with even a vague interest in contemporary art descends on London for Free's Art Fair. On day one, even legendary collector Charles Saatchi makes a rare public appearance to survey the wares. In five hectic days, tens of thousands of people will visit the fair and tens of millions of pounds will be spent. Behind the scenes, art dealers are saying, shit. God, I just sold that for 1.5 million, you know, and two years ago I couldn't sell that artist's work for $50,000. The reality is that people are coming from all over the world and they are coming with all different currencies, whether it's the euro or uh, coming from China or Russia, London seems to be the place. And somehow they don't get all the way to New York. So, in a sense, London's on the rise and New York's perhaps on the wane. And it's not just for the rich. Freeze is also the biggest exhibition in town. There's more art to see here in a week than in a year at most museums and galleries. I think the increased interest in art amongst the general public and amongst rich people is here to stay. I think it's become part of the cultural mix. People say that we're in a boom market. I don't really see any evidence of a boom market. What we're seeing now is just the beginning. The cliché is that it's not a bubble until it bursts. Bubbly apart, it certainly wasn't always like this. In the 1950s and 60s, art was mainly the preserve of the idle rich, and what they were buying were old masters. For art lovers, intellectual challenge was to arrive on these shores in the mid-70s. And it went down like a ton of, well, bricks. I think they're making fun of us. Um, I'm not really, have, don't respond artistically away. I guess I still respond, um, I guess, almost geometrically to, to these things. It's a pile of bricks. The Carl andre moment was a low point for Britain's timid art establishment as it failed to stand up for modern art, which became a term of derision throughout the country. It's very hard to become this passionately angry at something like the Carl andre bricks unless they're hitting something, some deep... It's hitting a cultural nerve. What was and that nerve, do you think? It's to do with pragmatism and practicality. It's the fact they're bricks and they're not doing anything. Nothing is happening. It's not a house. They're not even stuck together. They're not building a tower. They're doing nothing. 42,000 pounds. So, for over a decade, London was little more than a provincial backwater for contemporary art. 
Beyond a few galleries in Cork Street, Armour and Van Dyke's remained the order of the day. But things were starting to change. In 1985, Charles Saatchi opened his gallery at Boundary Road, showcasing his collection of American contemporary art. For British art students who visited, it was to prove transformative. Out of it emerged a whole new generation of British artists, and many of them were taught by the artist Michael Craig Martin. Students at Goldsmiths went to the shows at Boundary Road, and for the first time, young British students could see the greatest contemporary art in the world being done at exactly that time, being shown in the most perfect conditions you could imagine anywhere. But that's a kind of miracle for kids. A young Damien Hurst was among those inspired by what he saw. In the late 80s, he was involved in curating several seminal exhibitions in London, including Frieze and Modern Medicine. A visit to the latter was in turn to change the lives of two young Oxford graduates. I walked in and I looked around and I thought, my God, this is amazing. I actually understand this. This is really exciting. Mm. And it just felt like there was an extraordinary burst of energy. I mean, it was one of those moments, you could sense it, where you felt like there's really something going on here and these people are all great and we're all going to do something. It, it, you, you could just feel it, and I don't think those moments come along very often. I mean, I think, to be fair, when you're in those moments, you're not even aware it is the moment. You just are excited. Mm. It's exuberant. It feels like you can do things. Mm. Inspired by the YBAs, Matthew and Amanda launched Freeze magazine in 1991. It very quickly became the bible of the contemporary art scene. It hit its stride from the very beginning. The interview with Damien in the, in the first issue, he says, you know, well, I, I want to get a shark and I want to put it in a vat of formaldehyde, and we just thought it sounded incredible. But it was about works that he was intending to make. Recognition for the growing public appetite for contemporary art came in 2000, when Tate Modern opened, in, ironically enough, an old pile of bricks. London seemed to have finally come of age as an international capital of the art world. It just lacked one thing. We'd expected someone else to do a fair, to be honest. It was just seemed self-evidently necessary in London. It just seemed like the timing was right. Doing it in a tent in Regent's Park, it just seemed completely implausible. I mean, that it could even be blown away and that people would bring, you know, extremely valuable artworks. People thought... Uh, no one wants to come to London, there's not much going on, the, you know, the, there's no market, there's no collectors. Why would people come? You know, and they all came. And you know, suddenly we realised what a big sea change there'd been. I mean, when we started, there were perhaps three, four really fantastic commercial mm. galleries. Suddenly there were 35, 40, 50. It seemed all of a sudden as if the, the centre was shifting. It's because Amanda Sharp and Matthew Slotover really understand art, and had the experience with the magazine, that they did pull it off, and pulled it off better than anyone could have imagined. I don't think it was, you know, that London was just waiting for it by any means. I think they achieved something which was quite remarkable. Really. And with the market so buoyant, I'd be mad not to try to get a slice of the action for myself, so I'm going to take the plunge. I've decided to indulge my inner collector and try to purchase something with £5,000 of my own money before the end of freeze week. <laughs> 